uh, experience. So it doesn't, you don't feel the, the onus of trying to carry a conversation or, you know, it, it's, it's just a shared experience that is really profound um, to have with family members. Oh, well, this is good. This is a good segue into introducing you. <laughs> Excellent opportunity. <laughs> so welcome everyone. I'm Barbara Sullivan, the director of Village to Village Network, and I'm very pleased to welcome Eric Leviton and his group, Margaret, Kevin, Bevo. Um, you had a little bit of a glimpse of Bevo twice um, at our conference two weeks ago, one uh, where we had an exercise class and you know, a little stretch break. And then uh, again, with um, the presentation with uh, some of the villages that are participating. So um, I'm gonna let you take it away, Eric, go ahead. And oh, please everybody mute yourself. Uh, it is being recorded and we'll have questions at the end. How's that? Perfect, perfect. Well, uh, thank you very much, Barbara. And yes, this is hopefully maybe uh, um, not maybe not your first time hearing about it, but hopefully this will give uh, provide an opportunity mm -hmm. to get a little bit deeper into some of the conversation uh, from what you have seen over the last couple of weeks. We're really, really excited to already have some partnerships going with different villages and to talk a little bit more about that. But we wanted to expand on the discussion and really help take a step back and look at why are we even doing this to begin with? Um, we all know exercise is good for you, but exercise is this very broad term, right? And then and then as we get more into what we do with Vivo, specifically around building strength and function, why are we leaning into that so much? What is it about what we're doing uh, and, and how we do it that we feel so to, to bring to, um, to yourselves and to your members and what that opportunity looks like? And so... I'm really excited to introduce two other uh, team members today who I think um, really are going to uh, give you some, some deeper insight. Um, one of those people is, is Kevin Snodgrass, who is our head trainer, and he's going to actually take you through, Kevin's waving, uh, he's going to actually take you through a very simple demo to show you this is actually really approachable for everybody of any fitness level. And um, one of the things that we fully recognize is while we do know that exercise is good for you, we also know that it can be intimidating. And uh, not only can it be intimidating, I think there's an underlying level of, of um, hesitancy that exists in a lot of people that really has a foundation and maybe embarrassment and shame and not being comfortable with how to do this and not maybe wanting to expose that we're not as mobile and functional and strong as we used to be. And we understand that. And that is why we do what we do. We really want to make this accessible for everyone. We want to give people a safe place, a judgment-free place to come and to learn how to get more fit, to learn how to do activities of daily living in a more meaningful, safe way. And so um, Kevin is a certified fitness professional. He spent over a decade uh, working as a corrective exercise specialist, really helping people with chronic health issues, um, improve their strength and mobility. And he does, uh, he's responsible for the majority of the programming that we deliver on a daily basis. And then we're actually gonna transition over to Margaret uh, Danilovich, who is our VP of strategy. And she actually has a, a dual degree program in physical therapy and public health from Northwestern University. She is a doctor of physical therapist as a background who actually researches community-based exercise programs for older adults. And she's had research funded by the NIH and actually serves currently as an NIH study section for community-based health promotion. She has got a world of expertise around this area and we're very fortunate to have her as a part of our team. And she's gonna really dive into that kind of 30,000 foot view of exercise and aging and why it's so important and then kind of transition it back to me and I'm gonna get into a little bit more about Vivo. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Margaret who will kind of take that step back and hopefully give you some real context around why we're doing what we're doing. Thanks so much, Eric, um, and welcome everyone. I'm so excited to uh, be here with you today and to really talk about um, sort of what uh, the literature is saying about best practices for community-based exercise programs, specifically for older adults. 
So we all recognize that exercise is good for us. And as Time Magazine points out, exercise really is almost the cure for pretty much every condition that exists. Exercise makes us better. Um, but the unfortunate reality is that most older adults don't exercise enough. And the literature says that 30% of older people don't exercise one minute of the week. They are completely sedentary. Only 20% of older adults are actually getting the frequency of exercise that it's recommended by the CDC. And less than 10% of older people are consistently participating in strength training, exercises that we have to participate in to build our muscle strength so that we can do all of the activities of daily living that we want and need to do. And research would really say that there's a lot of reasons behind why, you know, so many people are sedentary or not getting this dose of exercise. And so this research that uh, comes out of the University of Washington really points to a number of different factors. So there's personal factors. Older adults express that they're concerned about exercising, that it's going to cause pain or create an injury, or that by exercising, they might fall. There's also preferences. There are people that just don't like exercising, or they feel like they don't have that motivation, or they acknowledge that it can be intimidating to go to a fitness facility because of their level of fitness, because they might walk in with a walker or a cane, or that someone sees them as an older person and expresses some stigma towards them. The research also points to environmental and structural factors. So when we think about our traditional sort of community classes, many times people have to go to a place to access these facilities and these programs. So locations might be inconvenient. People have to have transportation. And as older adults give up the ability to drive, this becomes an accessibility problem. There's also weather issues. I'm here in Chicago and four to six months out of the year, the weather is not so good. Good. And so that is a, a, a barrier. And frankly, it doesn't motivate me to go out when it's, you know, snowing and windy and below zero. And so these environmental structures uh, really serve to uh, present some opposition to exercising. Finally, the last piece that sort of uh, exists from the literature is that we know that there's really a lack of quality instructors, particularly for older adults. So in general, there are less people who are inclined to work with the geriatric segment, work with older adults. And so there's fewer people who have the knowledge in working with this population and the desire. And so there's these barriers. There's also concerns that we sort of have that are culturally driven, these exercise misconceptions. There's people that think I'm gonna have to lift these really heavy weights if I'm gonna build muscles and that exercise is gonna change my body. And I don't wanna be bulky. I don't wanna change my physique. I'm really concerned about that. And then there's this sort of thought that Unfortunately, if I participate in exercise, it might cause me more pain. And so people often have these associations that drive them to not exercise. We also know that many of the sort of fitness uh, options out there and the fitness industry doesn't necessarily cater to the needs of people 60 plus. Many gyms can be unwelcoming and inaccessible for older people. There are certainly lots of digital options out there. People can go on YouTube and find exercise, but you've got to actually get on YouTube. You've got to find the motivation to do it. No one's holding you accountable through these digital options. And we also know that as we get older, there are more health conditions associated with aging. And so people themselves and those that work with older adults often have a lack of knowledge about older conditions, uh, older people's needs, and how best to work with them. And so the end result is that our, our fitness landscape sort of doesn't have a lot of good solutions for people to get exercise. Work I've done at Northwestern uh, finds research that says the, the good news is organizations can actually influence exercise behavior. 
And so in this research that we did, we went and interviewed uh, people over the age of 65 who were living out in the community, many in retirement communities. And we asked them about what their communities and their organizations could do to help motivate them. And one of the major findings from our research was that older adults had this feeling that community-based exercise programs didn't really address the full range of needs that they had. And so some people acknowledged that the community programs had exercises that really weren't geared for people who used a walker or a cane. And then other people said, well, I'm actually very fit and the community programs are not geared for me. And the kind of commonality that we heard was that a lot of organizations then said, well, we don't know how to sort of work with the gamut of people. We're going to focus more on sitting only programs. And so a lot of people talked about how their organizations and their communities were offering sit and be fit type classes where people sat in chairs and moved in more gentle motions. And they acknowledged that these programs were not meeting their needs. And so the other kind of consideration we have to think about in terms of our community-based programming is we're faced with messages like this, exercises to avoid after 50, things to never do after 50, the biggest mistakes you can make, how you have to modify. And the end result is that people get scared because we're bombarded with the fact that something happens magically when we turn 50 and all of a sudden we have to be really nervous about exercise. And so unfortunately we have these cultural factors that also serve as barriers to our older adults from accessing good community programs. And so what we then have created is, is sort of this unfortunate situation where older adults maybe are scared of hurting themselves. And so they say, well, I just am not going to exercise because I, I don't want to aggravate my existing health conditions. We also have people who say, I just don't know what to do. I, I don't know what to do in the gym. It's overwhelming. It's intimidating. There's the, re the resources aren't there to help me for my specific needs. I'm just not going to exercise. And then we have organizations that say, I really don't know what to do. I had an organization recently say to me, we've got all these really fit residents in our building, in our community. We don't know how to provide classes to them, so we just don't. So what a missed opportunity. And so a lot of times, then organizations say, well, we need to offer an exercise program. Let's make it quote unquote safe. But it's often ineffective because it's this sit and be fit program. Let's sit in a chair, move our arms and legs in a gentle way and not meet people at the fitness level they're at. And this has actually been identified in the Choosing Wisely campaign, which is a public health initiative that identifies medical practices that are actually ineffective that we need to change. And Choosing Wisely has identified that these underdosed exercise programs, sort of the sit and be fit, where we're sitting in a chair, we're not using weights, we're not challenging our bodies for the fitness level we're at, these actually need to stop. And so one of the things we want to now think about is, well, if we need to not do this sort of ineffective, underdose, sit and be fit, what should we do? And what uh, sort of does the research say about what our community-based exercise programs should look like? So in 2018, the physical activity guidelines were released. And so as we're thinking about structuring exercise in our communities, these are the goals of programming that we want to provide to our older adult uh, clients. 150 minutes of aerobic exercise every week, two days per week of strength training and balance exercises. So specifically, what should our aerobic exercises look like? Well, the fundamental thing that we want to do is in our aerobic exercise programs, we need to increase our heart rate. So rather that whether that is through bicycling or swimming or walking, 
we need to actually get people's heart rates and breathing rates up. And this is all based on a large body of evidence that says there is a dose response relationship. So when we're sitting in a chair, we're not getting our heart rate up. We don't have much of a dose of exercise. And to have the best health outcomes, we need to turn our dose up, turn up that intensity so we get better endurance, better cardiovascular fitness. We should be exercising at an intensity of about 70 to 85% of our maximum heart rate. That's working up a bit of a sweat. You should feel like you're working hard to very hard. And the important part of this is what's good for your heart is also good for your brain. And so the, the research that's come out in the last few years on cognition says that even if people have been diagnosed with cognitive impairment, exercise can actually be beneficial. And exercise programs, when done consistently, can improve global cognition scores, even among people who have cognitive decline. The second major finding is that if we start engaging in exercise in midlife, we reduce our risk for dementia by 30% and our risk for Alzheimer's disease by 45%. So let it sink in. If we engage in exercise consistently, we're going to cut our risk for Alzheimer's and other dementias by about half. It's more effective than any medication, any other treatment out there. This is the single best thing we can do to help cognitive health among our older adults. And finally, exercise actually changes your brain. So when we take people that are exercising and we put them in MRI and we look at scans of their brains, the uh, area of the brain, the hippocampus that's involved in memory formation actually increases in size when older people are exercising. So all of these important reasons on why we really need to think about exercise, improving cognition for our older adults. Um, we also know that, you know, it's good to add in exercise, but it's even better if we add in dual task exercise. So what is dual task? It means exercising and then saying, name all of the animals you can, or listen to this story and then repeat it back to me while you're exercising. You're doing two things at once. And so this work out of India said, let's look at the role of dual task. So they took a bunch of older adults and they had them do an exercise group. And then they had another group of older adults who did the same exercises, but added in those dual task exercises. So they looked at cognition among the participants on something called the trail making test, which is shown here on the left. People have to go through and put these numbers in order, draw a line through them uh, numerically as fast as they possibly can. And so what they looked at uh, were the results in this trail making test at three weeks and just six weeks of exercise. So at three weeks, we see the orange and the blue are about the same, but at six weeks, the group in blue, that's the group that did the dual task exercises while they were exercising, their time to complete this trail making test decreased by 20 seconds. They were 20 seconds faster than the group that did the exercises only. They changed by about 14 seconds. So the, the key take home here is we want to get people exercising, but if we want our older adults to have even better cognition, we need them to exercise and dual task. So then finally, thinking about the best practices sort of for our strength training programs, it comes down to two main issues uh, and that we want to incorporate in our community-based classes, intensity and periodization. This position statement from the National Strength and Conditioning Association highlights that we need higher intensity strength training and that it's much more beneficial than these moderate or low intensities. So what does that mean? A low intensity is we're sitting and being fit. We're just moving our arms, no resistance. Higher intensity means I've got weights or a band that is challenging and I'm doing a set of 10 and saying, wow, I can feel my muscles working. I am challenging uh, for the fitness level I am at. And so if we want to get stronger, which we need to do so that we have that muscle strength to do all of the activities of daily living, we need to provide resistance and that higher intensity challenge to meet people where they're at. 
the second piece comes down to this idea of periodization. And so in our community programming, we know that the research says varying our routines actually leads to better outcomes. So this periodization means we're changing the intensity, the exercises, the number of repetitions. And this is based on some research that comes out of the University of Copenhagen that says, you know, it's, it's great when people exercise, but when they exercise and they periodize it, they change it up, they actually have greater gains in their muscle strength. And they have better neurophysiological adaptations, meaning their brain actually has better control of their body. So they have better motor control. It helps them be more mobile and less risk at, for falling. And so this is one of the challenges I see as someone who is doing a lot of community-based research that every Monday's class is the same and we're going through the same exercises. And then I go to a senior center and every Thursday class is the same. And while there's something about the familiarity that's great, the disadvantage when we keep it the same and we don't periodize is we're not building as much muscle strength as we need. So in sum, as we're thinking about our community-based programs, what are the best practices for how we should be approaching structuring these programs for older adults? The first is we have to get people out of their chairs and we need to turn up the intensity, particularly for the aerobic portion, get their hearts pumping so that they feel like they're working hard to very hard. We must add in those dual task exercises in order to enhance cognition. And then we really need to, again, turn up that intensity for our strength trainings and intentionally vary our exercise programs. So we're constantly challenging the fitness level of our older adults. So I'm gonna turn it over to Eric, who's gonna talk us through a little bit about the rationale behind strength training and Vivo. Thank you so much, Margaret. And so to kind of, hopefully that was a good under, you know, uh, a, a good overview to help understand we, again, we all know exercise is good for you. What are we really talking about when we're really thinking about how to translate that into a community-based organization, how to deploy that with older adults and where we really need to focus? And from a Vivo perspective, everything that Margaret just talked about is really the foundation for how we built this program. And we were very fortunate to have a team of really smart people, scientists and researchers from around the country who really helped us construct this. And we made a very... Uh, intentional decision from the beginning, which was to lean into this concept around strength training. And before we dive into Vivo and more about Vivo, I just wanted to talk through why we picked strength training. And I think for a lot of us, this is intuitive, but maybe we've never heard it explicitly described this way. And, and first and foremost, the thing to understand is a natural part of the aging process is that we all lose muscle mass mm -hmm. and strength as we get old. Yeah, I'm just, this I'm is just what happens to so. every person on the planet, uh, regardless yeah. of your gender, regardless of where you live. we It's a natural part of aging. But as a result of losing muscle mass and strength, it has a lot of negative consequences. It increases our risk of falls. That's kind of obvious. We see that, right? It also is responsible for losing bone density. Things like osteoporosis are happening because we're losing muscle mass. Uh, muscle mass helps regulate blood sugar. As we lose muscle mass, we reduce our blood sugar tolerance. Um, it inclu it uh, increases our uh, absorption of fat and, and throughout the muscular tissue, um, it begins to infiltrate and looks like marbling in a steak. And ultimately it reduces our quality of life and robs us of our independence. Losing our strength as we get older is a significant, significant thing that happens to every person on this planet. Next. But here's the amazing thing. There's something we can do about it. This concept of strength training has been scientifically proven for decades we've known this, that literally at any age and at any fitness level, you can engage in a strength training program and rebuild muscle, regain strength and function, and even rebuild bone density. And you can be 25 or 95 and have a similar experience and benefit from strength training. And not only is it about getting stronger, it's about preventing and controlling diseases of aging. We talked about cardiovascular disease, osteoporosis, type two diabetes, arthritis, et cetera. There are so many conditions related to aging that are either directly caused by or significantly impacted by a loss of muscle and strength as we get older. It reduces fall risk. Margaret already talked about how it improves cognition. 
Um, as a result, we can more effectively do activities of daily living and improve our quality of life, maintain our independence, and it even contributes to longevity. There was a study, a pretty landmark study done in 2016, not that long ago, that showed that people that consistently engaged in strength training had 46% lower all-cause mortality, 46%, almost half uh, of, a, of a less likely chance of dying from any cause for people that engage in strength training, that's pretty compelling stuff. As a matter of fact, there is a line that I heard in another presentation I saw once that I use often that said, if there is a fountain of youth in this world, it is strength training. It has so many broad-based benefits from improving sleep, losing weight, lowering blood pressure and cholesterol, it is really, really profound. And for that reason, we really leaned into this for what we're doing with Vivo. Next. So what is Vivo? We've been talking about fitness. We've been talking about exercise and, and strength training. Vivo is an online fitness program for older adults that is both live and interactive and small group. And let's talk about that. Much of what we see today in the online kind of digital fitness market are videos or live stream classes. A video is obviously something that we watch and we kind of do on our own. A live stream class is generally a one-way activity where you're watching someone that may be performing something live, but there's no feedback mechanism. You might be muted, maybe your camera's off. We really think it's important to provide that level of individualization such that we can see people, we can help keep them safe, we can correct form, we can modify an exercise if there's pain or discomfort or a specific situation that someone's dealing with. We can get people to work out to a level of challenge, as Margaret talked about, an intensity that actually results in outcomes. But at the same time, it's a big enough group that we're creating this very social experience where we really try to promote social engagement and the sense of community, because at the end of the day, the most important thing about engaging in any fitness program is doing it consistently. And what we're trying to do is behavioral change. We're trying to turn this into a habit. And what better way to do that than to build the sense of accountability through community? And so we've got these classes that are small. We cap them at eight people. And we do that intentionally so it's small enough that we can give individualized attention, but big enough that we're creating community and accountability. And it's really hard to do that in a group of 20, 30, 40, 50 people. It obviously doesn't happen if you're watching a video. A small group has a lot of, there's this magical element of a small group where it's much easier to provide that individualized feedback and create that social engagement that's really driving accountability. Um, we also track progress. We meet with every single member who joins our program, one-on-one, uh, -on -one, also virtually over Zoom, and we baseline their strength and balance. And then we reassess every two months so we can actually help provide people with the motivation that they need to keep going because spoiler alert, every single person who does this program gets stronger, literally 100%. We've never had an individual that was baseline assessed and reassessed two months later and did not get stronger. And by the way, it's not rocket science. This is how the human body works. If you do strength training consistently, you will get stronger. So it's really helpful and it's a great feedback mechanism to see the kind of progress that you make. Next. Uh, and this is not just your average fitness program we talked about. We've got a team of scientists and we are actually now funded by a grant from the National Institute on Aging underneath the NIH, where we're actually studying Vivo as a clinical intervention for older adults. Um, we're measuring progress. We're tracking this data. We're making sure that we're providing the results to our membership. Next. Um, We've talked, we've covered this, or Margaret kind of introduced these things. These are what we've incorporated into the Vivo program to make sure that we're really delivering on the promise of improving your life, maintaining your independence. We focus on strength. This is an interactive thing. We don't want people muted and having their cameras off. We want this to be an interactive experience. There's promoted social engagement. We're measuring progress. It's specifically designed for older adults with different fitness levels in mind. Kevin's going to introduce you to this a little bit more, but we recognize that there is a broad spectrum of mobility for anyone, regardless of your age, over the age of 50, and we need to accommodate all of it. And some people may be really strong from a lower body perspective and really not very strong from an upper body. And someone else might be the exact opposite. So how do we accommodate that? How do we accommodate people who maybe can't 
get down to the floor or really need to stay exercising in a chair. We've built that all into the program. And then last but not least, that whole concept of dual test exercises that Margaret talked about, where we're doing physical movements and doing cognitive recalls, um, we lean into that very much. That's a part of every single class that we do. And we're really focused on brain health. And as an aside, there's a wonderful social element to that that makes these classes fun and silly and light because we get people talking while they're exercising and it's kind of hard. Uh, so what does this ultimately mean and what are we seeing? Um, there's a couple of very important things to share with you all. Um, the first is you can see kind of the 22% increase in upper body strength, 27%, 25%. Roughly in the first two months of doing Vivo, these are the outcomes that we're averaging. Our customers average roughly about a 25% increase in strength across the board, strength and endurance. That's a big deal. Imagine being 25% stronger two months from now. And again, it's more than just being able to do more push-ups or squats. It's about better quality sleep. It's about losing weight. It's about improved mood, less anxiety, really, really important elements of healthy wellness. And then what I get most excited about as the, as the CEO of this company is our average monthly customer retention right now is 98%. What we are doing is extremely sticky. And as we talked about consistency and behavioral change and accountability, that's everything. The best program in the world won't do very much for someone if they don't do it consistently. What we are seeing is consistent engagement because this is a fun, social, community-driven experience that you just can't get from a video. And we figured out how to do this in a remote online way that actually drives that engagement. So we have existing uh, situations where we're working with different villages today. And in particular, we're working with Penns Village and North Shore and Peninsula Village, where we've introduced Vivo to their membership and have started to work with individuals from those different groups and even beyond that. So that's one way we can work with any village across the country today is just bringing this. We uh, can present a discount to them to really incent and make it available and introduce this concept of why is strength training so important and how to make this accessible in a way that feels less intimidating for folks. But we're also doing some joint research studies with a couple of villages as well. We just wrapped up a two month intervention with La Mirinda Village, where we actually did a joint research project with the University of San Francisco, where we did fall prevention analysis. And we're just concluding those results now. Um, and we will let you know how that goes in the next couple of weeks as we compile all the final assessments. Um, but it's a really super exciting kind of uh, joint research project where we have the opportunity to go in and not only engage people and start to get them more fit, but really analyze the impact that this can have on fall prevention and in engagement and retention. We're doing so, a different, completely different angle with the Denver-based A Little Help, where we are actually part of a larger community core uh, grant where they are doing outreach into rural Colorado and trying to attract new members. And as a part of that, using Vivo as that customer acquisition tool where we can get people into classes that may be remote and don't have access to trainers or fitness facilities and engage and meet other people in the A Little Help community and really create classes specifically for them. And we're gonna understand around engagement and how we improve social isolation. And so another really interesting opportunity to not only engage the members of A Little Help, um, but to help with customer, with prospective customer outreach and understand the scientific impact of what we're doing. So I just wanted to kind of give a little bit of a taste of how we're currently engaged with other villages to start to give you some ideas of, is this something that's interesting to me and how would we potentially use this program? Next. Um, there's uh, certainly, it's easy for me to sit here uh, and, and espouse the benefits of this. I think we wanted to give a little bit of a taste of where we're seeing our members really giving us fantastic feedback on what this has meant to them. And we actually have a couple of clips from some other uh, villages that will villagers that will will share with you in a second. These are some that we've just gotten, and I think it represents some different aspects. You guys can read them. Um, the top is really about 
um, someone who's never exercised before and how this has really engaged them. The middle one is really about improving quality of life and driving that accountability. And the bottom is not only are we seeing people engage, but what it means to them in terms of activities of daily living and what they can do. And the fact that they're riding bikes with their grandkids now as a result of doing Vivo. These are the kinds of testimonials that absolutely drive why we are doing this and keep everyone so laser focused on the fact that it's not just a fitness program. This is a fitness program that is clinical in nature and is driving real world outcomes. Uh, there's a lot to read here. Jane uh, from the North Shore Village was gracious enough to send us a video. Unfortunately, the audio was a little low that we couldn't really get to turn up um, through this, but you can read. Uh, we'll, we'll give you a second to kind of read through this. And Margaret, I don't know if you want to uh, highlight some, um, some of the key elements within here, but uh, we are so thrilled that Jane has been able to not only bring this to the North Shore Village, but actively participate and have it significantly changing her quality of life. And I think Jane's on the call today. So thank you, Jane, oh. for uh, being here uh, for your quote. And I want to just highlight, um, you know, I think Jane uh, emphasizes, you know, the, the nature of the small groups that she's in a class with uh, no more than six people and her own functional improvements that she started doing push-ups from the wall and has now progressed. Um, and I, I love the last paragraph, you know, while the class is going on and the leader is providing feedback, people are responding. This is two-way. It's two-way communication, which is really the heart of what makes Vivo so interactive and fun. And thank you very much, Jane. I love that you're here. So at this point, I want to turn it over to Kevin. And there's nothing like seeing firsthand what this is all about. Um, we'll have a couple more slides when Kevin's done just to talk to you about opportunities for ways to engage with us if it's something that you think is beneficial for bringing to your members. Um, but with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kevin. Eric, thank you. Margaret, thank you. My name is Kevin Snodgrass. I'm the head trainer for Bebo. Uh, I am responsible for the program design for training all of our trainers. Um, we, we could talk for the next uh, 35 minutes about mm, programming design and periodization, all that stuff, but I would love to stop and hear from you guys, all right? Uh, we've, we've heard about why exercise is important. We've talked about um, what it does for your body and for your brain. We've talked about how we can adjust and adapt these exercises to meet you at whatever fitness level you're at. Um, but one slide that Margaret touched on uh, that, that really hits home for me was the objections, right? So uh, I got started into fitness really late in my life. I was, I was afraid of failing. I was afraid of not being good enough. I was afraid that it would be too hard. Uh, I was afraid that I would embarrass myself. And so I did not do anything active for most of my life. Uh, it wasn't until things started to fall apart and hurt and I got a little bit older that I was like, oh, I need to, stay, I need to start doing something. Um, my mom was just like, you know, Eric had mentioned very, very early on on the call. My mom was one of the early adopters of Vivo. And when I asked her, when I asked my mom to come do this, try this out with us, she said, no, she said no to my face. <laughs> she said, I'm not going to do it. It's too hard. I was like, mom, you don't know what we're going to do. She's like, I can't do it. It's whatever it is. It's too hard. I was like, mom, I promise I will make it work for you. She said, no, it's too hard. Now, two and a half years later, she is still doing it. She has gone from push-ups off the wall to push-ups off the floor. But that was her big objection was it was going to be too hard for her. So I, I want to ask, I want to ask from, from, from you, from you guys, what is something that you have said or that you have heard somebody else say that is a reason you don't do strength training or don't do the 150 minutes of regular exercise that is recommended? You can raise your hand, you can yell out, you can hit the raise your hand button, but I want to hear from somebody here. Don't have time. Don't have time. Who said that? Maureen. Maureen, don't have, don't have time. Uh, tell me, what does that, what does that mean? Is it schedules too busy? Is it driving to the gym is too hard? Is it that figuring out what to do takes a long time? What does that mean? You don't have time. Um, all of those things and, and, uh, partly not, not wanting to make the commitment. Okay, that's fair. 
All right. Uh, show of hands, has anybody, has anybody thought that uh, my, my, my schedule is set, my day is busy, uh, it is a lot, it's a lot to, to, to pack, yes, agreed. Okay, somebody else, uh, what's another thing that you have said or you've heard somebody else say, there's a reason that we don't do this, the reason we don't get the 150 minutes a week of regular exercise? I don't really need it. You don't really need it. Yes. All right. Uh, who has thought, who has thought aches and pains? Who has thought aches and pains are just part of getting older, right? I have arthritis in both knees. I had surgery uh, three and a half months ago, right? Uh, you know, dealing with pain and living in pain is something I'm familiar with and something that I know to be true that we don't have to endure. But so many of us think that this is just part, it's just part of getting older. And that is both unfair and it's untrue. What else? What's another one? We've got can't commit, don't want to don't carve out time for it, right? Don't think I need it. What is another one? What's one more? Anybody? Too lazy. Too, too lazy. All right. Er, Eric, does that speak to your soul, buddy? Uh, what, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, Eric, who skipped my 930 workout today, does that speak to your soul? That is fair. All right. All right. Well, I want to I want to talk real quick about Vivo in particular, right? So Vivo, when, when it's when it when it comes to not being able to carve out time for this, right? This is a 45 minute session that you do in your house. You don't have to drive to the gym. You don't have to figure out what to do. We bring it to you wherever you are. If you're on vacation, great. We'll come to you. If you're at your house, great. We'll come to you. Right. This is all virtual. All you have to do. All you have to do is, is hit start. We're going to send you an email with the exercises, the workout that you're going to do. And on there's a big button that says join now. The hardest part is just hitting that button that says join now, right? And it's 45 minutes all in. That's it. The warm up, the workout, the cool down, 45 minutes. 45 minutes to feel better, to feel empowered, to walk out of there, walk out of this session, knowing that you can do hard things, knowing that you've done something good for yourself and you've had fun doing it. The lazy one, I love it. I, I love it. It does speak to my soul. This stuff is hard, right? This stuff is uncomfortable. Margaret's talking about you got to challenge yourself to get better. This stuff is hard. Why would we do it? It's hard because it's also fun. A big part, a big part of Vivo, and a big part of Vivo is the community and the fun. My mom, my mom and her group, her Tuesday, Thursday, 9 a.m. group, they, they did not know each other before Vivo started. I early on, I gave them my cell phone number and started a group text. I have 85 unread text messages right now a majority of the these text messages are from my mom's group because they have built a community they have built a social network they have fun in these groups and they have friendships and so this the idea of it being lazy is totally fair and also it's going to be a fun experience with your friends with people you didn't know were going to be your friends and i don't think that i need it I don't think I need it. I, I, I feel that in my soul as well, right? Because when we're, when we're young and nothing hurts, great. And as we get older and things start to hurt, we feel like, man, this is, just part, this is part of getting older. It doesn't have to be, right? Waking up with back pain, who does that? Who wakes up and like things are stiff? Who wakes up and it's like, oh man, it takes me a little while to get moved. My knees hurt, my back hurts, right? My shoulders, my neck hurts. It doesn't have to be that way. The more that we build muscle around the joints, the more that we can build support around the structure, the better our lives are going to be, the less pain we're going to be, and the easier it's going to be to do the things that we want to do. As anybody, because I know I have, I had surgery three and a half months ago, I lost a lot of things that I like to do. Who, who has lost something that they like to do? Whether it's you know going for a run or a bike ride, that doesn't feel safe anymore. This is, it, feels, it feels uncomfortable, it feels hard. Or playing with grandkids, getting down on the floor. If you are thinking that is something that I can't do now, that's not fair to you, right? You don't have to live that way. You don't have to think that way. By doing and engaging in strength training, you can get back some of the things that you've lost. So when we say, you know, I don't feel like I need it, think about the things that have been taken away and think about getting them back by engaging in, in a fun, interactive 45 minutes with your friends that yes, will be challenging, but also is something that you can do. All right. I know Eric set it up. He's like, you got to show him some exercises. Okay. All right. I, I want you guys, I want you guys to move with me real quick. I'm a, I'm an energetic person. I'm highly caffeinated. I want you guys to move with me real quick. All right. Let's do, let's do a little simple warm up game. Let's do a simple warm up game. 
All right. You can do this with your cameras on. You can do it with the cameras off. You can do it standing or you can do it seated. All right. What we're going to do, guys, is mostly just move our arms. Right. I want to just move our arms. Okay. I want everybody, I want everybody to do five big shoulder circles. Let's do five big shoulder circles. Okay. We're just, we're just going to start to prep our, our arms, maybe our shoulders, our chest for what's coming next. Give me five big shoulder circles and then go the other way. Five big shoulder circles the other way. And as you're doing this, if anything hurts, Pause what you're doing. If anything feels uncomfortable, it shouldn't feel. This should be fun. This should be light. Okay. Now let's get three big slow neck circles. Give me three big slow neck circles, and then we'll go the other direction. Three big slow neck circles going the other direction. All right. Now I want you to take your left hand and try to reach for the floor, and I want you to take your right arm and reach overhead. Left arm down, right arm, reach as far over your head as you can. All right, and let's switch. Take the right arm, reach for the ground. Take the left arm, reach as far over your head as you can. Okay, let's do that one more time, but let's synchronize our breathing. Take the left hand, reach down. Take the right arm. We're going to reach overhead, but give me a big exhale as you do it. And one more time, right arm, reach down. Left arm, reach overhead, big exhale. All right, now take the right arm. You're going to twist to the left, and I want you to reach behind you with your right arm. Give me a big exhale as you do it. Imagine you're trying to get something you know, out of the back seat of the car here. All right. And let's turn and do the other side. Left hand, reach over your right shoulder, big exhale. Let's do that one more time. Rotate and reach. And last one, rotate and reach. All right. I promised we'd do something fun. That's not fun. Let's do something fun. Bring your hands up, hands up by your face. Okay. All right. Guys, we're going to do some shadow boxing. This is, this is Eric's favorite dual task. We're going to do some shadow boxing. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you four, four punches. They're gonna be numbered one, two, three, four, all right? And then we're gonna build a combination. All right, number one, left hand, punches straight out and straight back in. Everybody do that. Number one, out and in. One, one, one. Let's do this a couple of times. One, straight out, straight back in. One, one, one. All right, let's do number two. Number two is the right hand. Right hand straight in, out, straight back in. Two, 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 that's the right hand. Straight out, straight back in, all right? Let's do one, two, ready? Go, one, two, left, right. Let's do it again. One, two. One more time. One, two. Easy. All right. Now let's do hooks. Three. Number three. That's going to be the left hook. Okay. Bring your arm around in front of your face. Three, three, three. Left side three. Okay. And let's add four. Let's do four. That's going to be the right hand. Bring it around in front of your face. Four, four, four. Okay. Let's go through all of them. One, two, three, four. Ready? Go. One, two, three. Four. Let's do that again. One, two, three, four. One more time. One, two, three, four. Eric, give me a number. Two. Two. Margaret, give me a number. Four. Barbara, give me a number. Eight. Between one and four. Oh, sorry. Three. Two, four, three. That is our combination. We're going to do two, four, three. That is a right punch straight out, straight back in. That is a right hook and then a left hook. Ready, set, go. Two, four, three. All right, let's do that again. Two, four, three. This combination is a right punch straight out, straight back in, a right hook, and then a left hook. Two, four, three. We're going to challenge our brains here because we're going to add, we're going to add a number. All right, let's add one. Two, four, three, one. Okay, ready? Bring your hands up. Ready? Go. Two, four, three, one. All right, let's do that again. Two, four, three, one. Two, four, three, one. All right, a number one through four. Barbara Talbert, can you give me a number between one, two, three, and four? One. One. All right, we're going to add another one. Two, four, three, one, one. Okay, we're gonna challenge your memories, guys. Here we go. Hands up, ready? Two, four, three, one, one. That extra one is for Barbara. Ready? Two, four, three, one, one. One more time. Two, four, three, one, one. All right, Maureen, I see you moving. Maureen, can you give us a number between one and four? Two, four, three, one, one. Three, Maureen said three, two, four, three, one, one, three. All right, hands up, ready, go. Two, four, three, one, one, three. All right, one more, two, four, 
three, one, one, three. My favorite part of this is seeing Margaret, our doctor of physical therapy and our MBA sitting there like, I can't remember what the numbers are. That's perfect. That's what we're trying to do is challenge your brain, challenge your brain and your bodies. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna pause there. That is an example of the dual tasks that we do. Uh, these should be light, these should be fun, they should engage your brain, they should engage your body. All right, I also, I wanna do a demonstration real quick of one exercise that is probably the most common, most common complaint that I hear. When somebody comes to Vivo for the first time, almost always they say, I can't do squats. No, I can't, I can't, I can't, do, I can't do squats. I, yeah, I can do everything, I can't do squats. All right, well, we have designed with Vivo, we have designed what we call a level system. It is a way to progress and regress an exercise so that we can accommodate anybody wherever they are at whatever functional capacity they are. All right, so with the squat as an example, a lot of people have sticky knees or bad knees or arthritic knees, great. But we need to be able to do squats because we gotta be able to get up and down off of the couch. We gotta be able to get up and down off the toilet and out of the car, right? These are important activities of daily living. We have to be able to do this movement. But for some people doing a squat can be really, really challenging. So we have designed a level system that will allow us to pick a squat variation, right? Uh, give you a squat variation that's appropriate for wherever you are. All right, the first level variation of the squat, I'm gonna demo, I'm gonna spotlight myself so you guys can see me. The first level that we would do is just a hip opener. So for somebody who you know, struggles with balance and stability or has bad knees or really uh, doesn't have the strength to be able to balance through the squat, what we can do is a seated version of this, where instead of asking them to do a squat, I'm gonna ask them to sit in a chair and then bring a foot up and over, one at a time, bring a foot up and over. This is an easy exercise for building strength through the hips and starting to build strength through the muscles that we'll need on a squat variation. So this would be an example of a level one squat. A level two squat is gonna be a little bit more challenging. This is gonna be a chair stand. So this is for somebody who can stand unsupported, right? But lacks the, lacks the ability to get down to the bottom of the squat unassisted. So here, a level two variation would be standing up out of a chair and then sitting back down, right? This is a great way to practice, again, an activity of daily living. Sitting to the chair, and standing up. The level three version of this would be unassisted, doing the same movement, but without the chair for support. And so here it's gonna be a lot more challenging. It's gonna require balance and stability and coordination. It's gonna require a lot of strength and control at the bottom of the movement, right? That's a level three variation. And then a level four variation would be a squat holding on to a weight, like a heavy water bottle or a dumbbell or an exercise band. These are examples of, these are examples of uh, an exercise progression and regression system that we'll use in our workouts. I want to real quick share what that'll look like in a Vivo session, okay? I'm going to share part of my screen so you guys can see how we use this in our workouts. So this is the workout that we ran today. This is the work, Eric, this might, I was going to say it might look familiar, but you skipped my workout today. All right. So if you look at this, what we have here is our progression and regression system built in to the workout. So every day, every day, every single session, every participant, every member is going to look at this and say, okay, here are the options for the exercise. I'm going to pick the variation that works for me. So here, this is our squat. This is our squat variation right here. The level one version is what I showed you. It's a seated hip opener. It's a seated sidestep. Level two is an assisted movement. Level three is unassisted and level four is weighted. So you'll pick that. You'll pick that exercise variation that feels right for you and we'll stick with that one for the day. Same with, for example, the lunges or the cardio part, the marching, right? Level one would be seated. Level two is gonna be a little more challenging. It's standing. Level three and four are running. What this allows us to do is make sure that each person who comes to this workout doesn't say what my mom told me on the first day, which is this is too hard. I can't do anything, right? Every person, every single day is going to get the experience that is right for them. If you can do jump squats, we're going to do jump squats. If you need to do a seated exercise to help support your knees, we have that exercise variation. All right. I'm, I'm seeing some comments pop up. I want to see if we can address those real quick. Oh, what exercises should people with osteoporosis 
um, avoid, this is great. Um, we wanna avoid with this, we wanna avoid a lot of bending and twisting of the spine, especially under load or on dynamic movements. Um, we have several members who have osteoporosis and we offer um, adjustments uh, to the exercises to make sure that they stay safe. We're gonna work on keeping the spine stable through our movements. We need to make sure that we're challenging the muscles around the spine to build enough support that we can keep those, um, that structure and those joints stable. So things like uh, if, you're, if you're rounding forward to do a toe touch, we need to make sure that your back stays flat as you bend forward, right? Um, if we're doing a, a rotational core exercise, we're gonna swap that out for something that is more of a stability exercise. It's a great question. Um, all right. If you have any other questions as we're going through this, please put them in the comment box. I'm, I'm happy to address your specific needs. I would love to hear from you guys um, why you, maybe why you don't uh, exercise, why, why this doesn't work with your schedule. And we'll talk about how Vivo can help accommodate you. But I am right now, I'm gonna turn this back over to, uh, to Eric and, and have him show you the last of the slides. Thank you so much, Kevin. And hopefully everyone's getting a, a good sense of, of why what we're doing is working uh, by experiencing what, what you know, Kevin just walked us through. Is, it is truly engaging, it is fun, uh, it is at times silly, but it also is getting people to really engage. So what we are ultimately getting to, and, and maybe we can actually skip past this, um, Margaret, in the interest of time, we are running short on time and I wanna be sensitive to everybody. Um, one more quick testimonial from um, Hillary Simmons, who is the executive director at A Little Help in Denver. And I think as we've launched this process and this initiative on this grant research with her, um, she's got some, uh, some feedback that uh, she shared for us. Hi, I'm Hillary Simmons, the executive director of A Little Help, a village in three locations throughout Colorado. Mm -hmm. We've partnered with Vivo over the last several months as an additional value for our older members and volunteers. Strength training brings so many benefits to our community members and Vivo's team has been great to work with. To kick off programming within our village, Vivo's been so helpful in providing marketing materials for our monthly newsletter, presenting on webinars, and offering introductory pricing for our members. We're all passionate about empowering older adults to thrive, and Vivo's differentiation in the marketplace with live classes, flexible ability levels, and the social and mental engagement during classes made our decision to partner with them easy. I'm happy to share more about our experience with Vivo. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out at hillary at a little help org, And I hope you'll consider partnering too. Thanks. And that was uh, extremely kind. So um, we're, we, we actually, uh, we absolutely love um, in engaging with specific initiatives like what we're doing with a little help. And as she mentioned webinars, there's a lot of opportunity for us to even outside of the actual exercise classes, we can do something similar to what we're doing today for your organizations. So we can go on and deliver a presentation on the importance of strength training as you age, what the right prescription dose for exercise is, things like that. We've got nutritionists, we can do brain uh, health um, presentations. Um, we've got this really um, excellent team of scientific advisors that is very capable of doing not just fitness classes, but we can deliver presentations to your audience as well. And that's super easy for us to do. But if you wanted to engage on a deeper level, we actually have two ways to do this. As an affiliate partner, which is how Penn's Village, et cetera, and North Shore Village is, is engaging with us today, where we can be a resource directly for your members. We can do lectures and presentations like I just mentioned, and we can also just provide the ability for members to come in and sign up as individuals or as groups. And that's one very, very straightforward thing that we can turn on literally automatically um, if it's something that you're interested in bringing to your membership base. Um, we can also do something different, which we're calling being a programmatic partner, where we actually provide the programming specifically for your village. And so if you're currently engaged with a physical location, for instance, where you're actively recruiting trainers to lead fitness classes, this is something that we can do um, with uh, in partnership with you, where we can provide those skilled trainers, that programming, and that access that if some people want to participate remotely, if some people want to actually come in person and participate um, in a, in a um, co-populated room, um, we can actually make that happen. And so if you go to the next slide, Margaret, um, this is just a couple of ways to reach out essentially 
Uh, Margaret at teamvivo.com, Margaret, who did um, really introduced you all to kind of this understanding the importance of exercising as we age. She's really our lead uh, on a strategy and partnership perspective for the Village to Village Network. She can certainly help um, with any kind of rollout of this program to your members. We can talk about what that rate looks like, what kind of discounts we can work out to make this more attractive to your members so that they can sign up and really start to see the benefits of what engaging with this is. And um, she just put her, I think, name and email address in the chat. So you can also get it there if you don't get it here, but it's margaret at teamvivo.com. And likewise, if you're interested in more of that programmatic partnership uh, on the next slide, um, likewise, reach out to Margaret. We can start to talk to you about dates and times that might work for you. So if you wanted one class a week, two classes a week, three classes a week, 10 classes a week that you wanted to offer to your members as more of um, supplementing if you're currently organizing fitness classes already. Um, this is also a really easy thing for us to do where we can provide you the Zoom link, you can send it out to your members, and then they can log on from home or in person if you really want uh, people to come in and be together in person, which I know a lot of us are trying to look for ways to do it. So we are up against time, but I do want to leave um, opportunities for questions. Uh, for those of you who need to drop, uh, I apologize this ran so long, but hopefully this was interesting. Hopefully this gave you some insight into A, whether you end up uh, partnering with Vivo or not, understanding not only the importance of exercise, which I think most of us do, but really strength training, knowing that it is that fountain of youth. It does provide you with so many broad-based benefits from fall prevention to cognitive benefits, to warding off diseases of aging and really maintaining independence and quality of life and figuring out how to incorporate that into your own lives, into the lives of your members. And if there's something that we can do to facilitate that and to partner with you, we'd be thrilled. We are seeing really amazing results with our members today. We're so excited about the impact this is having. And we know the potential for really changing the narrative around how we think about aging. Aging does not need to equate to decline, but we need to understand what to do about it. And that what to do really revolves around maintaining our strength, maintaining our ability to do activities of daily living, and that's all about strength training. So hopefully you found this informative. Here's our email addresses once again. Feel free to reach out. Um, for those of you who may have questions and have a little bit more time and want to stay, happy to answer, do some Q&A right now. And you can feel free to take yourself off mute, raise your hand. MJ, I'm seeing you raise your hand. Yeah, no, I think it's really great. Um, I'm just uh, trying to figure out, um, you provide the classes uh, and the, uh, the link uh, via Zoom, and then I send the link out to my members and either they're all gonna join as individuals or we as a village buy your services and provide it to our members, correct? That's correct. Okay, so I will send an email to Margaret. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Other questions? Well, I'm going to say something. I, I think when you started the conversation, uh, it piqued my interest, especially about the cognitive. And, you know, having a family member that has mild cognitive impairment and trying to get, I've seen the results directly. I mean, he is working with a physical therapist, but independently, that's the next step. And there is definitely an improvement. And we have a lot of um, villages that are participating in a dementia program. Uh, for their members. This would be another level of, of opportunity for those that are really concentrating on the dementia-friendly village um, aspect. So I just wanted to take a shout out for that. Well, and that's and that's a really uh, fantastic point, Barbara. Um, there's some, one of the, and you heard, I think Hillary mentioned it, I don't know if anybody picked up on or not, they're actually engaging their own volunteers um, as a part of this program as well. And we actually just, we, we're working with the NIA right now on a study um, with Duke University School of Medicine as our research partner, studying the impact of EVO on older adults with prediabetes and, and type 2 diabetes. Um, we actually just submitted a grant with the Emory School of Medicine here in Atlanta, okay. Georgia. 
to actually study the impact of Evo on older adults with mild cognitive impairment participating with their caregivers that are not only measuring the impact on sustained mobility and function for older adults with MCI as the disease progresses, but also on relieving the caregiver burden that's occurring between the, the, the caregiver and who they're caring for. Because we all know that the health and wellness of the caregiver suffers too, right? When, when they get involved, uh, because you're so focused on who you're caring for. And it's really important to maintain your health and wellness as you are a caregiver. And having this shared experience, you know, Kevin talked about doing it with his mom. Uh, for those of you who, who joined a little early and heard the story of, of me doing it with my dad, it is this profound kind of shared experience of, of that that is drawing us closer together. And it's facilitating a connection that doesn't happen with just regular phone calls because it's a shared experience that we're both participating in. And so the caregiver is, is, is another opportunity. Um, we're also starting to um, work with area agencies on aging on specifically targeting caregivers as, as an opportunity. So it's something else to think about. And I'm glad you mentioned that, Barbara. Yeah. Good. Excellent. Well, thank you all so much for your time. I'm sorry we went a couple of minutes over. Guys, no, no problem. Forward. Appreciate your time. And uh, I'm going to be doing the punches. I think I might have to. It, it's it's a good one. And by the way, that is uh, uh, you'll see that also in Parkinson's um, uh, therapy, where they really lean into boxing as, and that's that whole concept of dual test exercises, where you have to remember the the number association with the type of punch, and um, it's a fabulous activity for for individuals with Parkinson's and other neurological disorders. I love it. That's great. Bad news, Barbara, is that there are ten different punches you have to remember. <laughs> I was like Margaret. I was, I was like a challenge. <laughs> We're good with four. <laughs> I, and I can't, I have to stop looking at the camera because I'm thinking I'm going with my left and I'm going with my right. Mm -hmm. I got yeah, to opposite. Yeah. I know. All right. I have to <laughs> all right, Thank you all very much. It was a pleasure.